Welcome to the Average Nobody's Podcast, the ultimate home for wrestling enthusiasts, beer drinkers, movie quoters, and pop culture connoisseurs. Here are your hosts, Matt and Ryan. Welcome to the Average Nobody's Podcast, number 52 for October 17th, 2017. On today's show, we'll be discussing Van Talk. A uh, new controversy that a couple of the Barstool personalities have with current ESPN personality Sam Ponder. We're also going to be talking Kevin Smith, what we're watching, and we'll finish up with TV Club reviewing episode six of The Deuce entitled Why Me? You can chat with us on Twitter at Average Nobodies. Toss us a like on Facebook at Average Nobodies. Heart all of our pictures on Instagram, also at Average Nobodies. Don't forget this podcast is available on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and YouTube. My name is Ryan, and with me as always... The Mateo. The Mateo. Uh, you've, have you changed your name legally to Mateo yet? Uh, it, the paperwork's in the mail. Uh, meaning okay. I just kind of wrote Mateo de Mateo on a piece of paper and I put it into an unaddressed stamped envelope and threw it out the window of my house. So, well, I, if there's a different way to do it, then I, exactly. I, I'm not aware. <laughs> exactly. That's, that, that's how I know to get your name changed legally. And then of course you just, you turn a blind ear to it, a deaf ear to it, I guess, not blind ear. Yeah. All ears are blinds. Yes. That's, that's true. That's actually, that's, I think Aristotle said that. He did. Yep. <laughs> Very good. And look at him. He's dead now. But, uh, so as usual, we're off the rails to begin. Um, but I, it's, it's, a, it's not a secret. We're huge Barstool fans and yes. huge news. Yeah. Huge news for a few of our favorite personalities, uh, Big Cat, uh, PMT commenter, and of course, uh, Hank. Who yeah, yeah. Really, uh, he's, he's like an under the radar he, personality. He's really. had a meteoric rise at Barstool. Like, like nobody else. Like, he's gone from being taped on the wall by Prez, like, at the Milton office where they lived with squirrels, and now he's producing an ESPN show. Like, <laughs> and, and not only that, but he also produces three times a week the number one podcast in the world. Yep. Which is, I mean, you know, it usually is, like, it, it goes back and forth between that and Joe Rogan's podcast, but, you know. But they're cra- there, I mean. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. And, and, and like you said, like, Three of our favorite personalities at Barstools, because you couldn't really have you couldn't really have this news like happen to three nicer guys, especially in the lot at Barstool. Like, you know, there are some you know not shady characters, but you know, like Prez all the time doesn't come off looking the best in the news, <laughs> and like nope. guys like Smitty, and then of course like they had a few guys that were fired because of some things they said. So, you know, like all the Barstool employees are are funny and whatever, but you know. Nobody is like these guys. I mean, nobody works harder than Big Cat and PFT nope. and Hank, and it shows. And they're just genuinely funny. So this is awesome. So they're starting their Van Talk uh, TV show that starts. It's going to start. It's technically Wednesday mornings at one o'clock, you know, but like they're advertising it as Tuesday nights, you know, at one o'clock. Um, and it's going until they said until the Super Bowl, at least until the Super Bowl, unless it gets renewed for a new show. Uh, like a new, a new season or a new like set of episodes. So, yeah, yeah, and it's uh, it's gonna be cool. I'm, I'll definitely be staying up to watch it. Yeah, um, for sure. Looking forward to it. They're just they they just have a great camaraderie with with guests, and they kind of put people at ease right away because they don't mind making fun of themselves. That I think is yeah. a huge part of why they're so successful because they can be self deprecating. They don't take themselves too seriously. Yeah. Uh, so I, I I wish them all the best. Not a sentiment shared by everyone. Not everyone is wishing them all the best. Nope. Um, you know, Barstool is, it's it, it's not, uh, controversial is not the right word because they're not a really a controversial, I don't think, website. No, they, uh, they are exactly who, you know what I mean? Like, if you know, and this is going to sound like such a biased thing because like, I read Barstool all the time, but like, if you know Barstool, it's not controversial. It's, this is just how they are. Right. You know I mean, this is just like. Product- they're a product of our kind of society now for our age bracket where every every you know blog, every company is really catering towards not offending, being sensitive. And I'm not saying you have to go out and call someone a piece of shit and make fun of them for yeah. a disability. That's yeah. that's not it, but at the same time to not do things because you might oh, this person over here might not like it. Look, do it. If you yeah. think it's funny, if if you think 
it's you know going to be like good for for your website then go ahead and do it and yeah. if it's a mistake if it's a misstep you can always you know go back on it and apologize and regroup but they're really i mean they're kind of known for just just doing it you know while everyone else kind of caters to to everyone you know to to make sure no one's offended they're like you know what screw it we actually kind of hope we offend you <laughs> yeah no definitely and and like you were saying like in in barstool is not the website that's just going out there to throw shit out there to stir the pot like that's not what they're doing. They're doing. They're saying things that everybody's thinking. It's like that kind of thing. Yep. And yeah. when you ride the line like that, like how they're doing, you're you you become successful. How they become successful. Now they're not like the baked Alaskas of this world. Like I don't know if you're familiar with his his work. They they got into a battle with him a while ago, a few months ago. But he's the type of guy that he just goes on Twitter and spits like hate speech and like all this shit just to get people riled up. You know what I mean? Like, right. And tries to defend himself. It's not yeah, bad at all. He knows, he knows there's a portion of of Twitter that believes that. So it's yeah. almost worse. Like at least what Barstool's doing, they they believe in. The the statements they're making are their actual thoughts. Right. But you're right. There are people out there who say it just to be manipulative and just to just yeah. to get shit going, which is wrong. Yeah. So um, any so anyway, one of the people that's not happy or not happy, but she was kind of came off very condescending. She uh Sam Ponder. Um Works for ESPN. Mm. Uh, she's also married to Christian Ponder, the ex NFL. Does he is he still in the league somewhere? Or he's not in the league. Uh yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, you know what? He might be. I mean, he might be. He's not Colin Kaepernick, so they'll probably give him a role somewhere. <laughs> That's true. He, uh, but he used he, to play for the Vikings. He's, he's, yeah, he's a, maybe he's a second or third string somewhere, but he doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um. She went on Twitter and basically to the gist of um, like you know, welcome, but really like fake welcomed, um you know, the Barstool guys to ESPN because, you know, now ES Bar, it's really just Big Cat, PFT, and Hank going over to ESPN. And then she brought up some, like, shitty things that Prez, Dave Portnoy, said about her in a rundown, like, three years ago. And was, like, you know, like, call- calling her a slut or whatever, like, slutty something, you know, he strung together all these words, as, as Prez usually does, and, like, said all these, you know, not so great things that she, pro- that she definitely held on to. She held a grudge oh. until this time. <laughs> Um, she, and then, she had it ready. She had it ready to go. Yeah, and then she like put it really out there, good. and then like everybody was like, "Listen, like you don't even know like what is really going on here." It's like this is not this is not Prez. Like this is Big Cat. Like, and then she did not immediately go back on her work on her tweet about it. She, oh, she and, left it for a while, for for nine hours. Yeah, and then she went back and she's like, "Oh no, Big Cat was just Dan was just laughing, you know, like laughing at, about it. You know, what I mean, trying to still like group him in." And I thought this was the most astute, like, thing. It's, like, ESPN and Barstool are both very adamant. That, like, they're not – they're working with Barstool, but they're working with Big Cat, Hank, and PFT. And right. someone tweeted her and was, like, this is, like, um, someone being mad at Christian Ponder for playing football with child abuser Adrian Peterson. Yeah. That that's that's basically awesome. the and I thought that was like I was trying to figure out like where my like where my head lies in this whole situation because a lot of times it's tough to defend things that Barstool does when stuff gets like dragged up like this, but mm. that that kind of is like a good point. It's like you know like we're we're so excited for Van Talk to go on for for Big Cat and for PFT, like this has nothing to do with press. This has nothing to do with press. And for you to do that, also it undermines ESPN because imagine your I don't know. Imagine you're Disney, right? And you have a Disney director that's like talking shit about a new director that's putting out a movie soon. You know what I mean? Like that doesn't look good for the company. No, it doesn't. Right? That doesn't look good. I think that was very unprofessional. So, especially if you're going after someone who didn't, you know, do any of these things. I'm not. I love Barstool. I'm not a huge El Prez fan. I think he's he's an asshole. Oh yeah. Um, and I'm sure maybe some of his personality, you know, maybe some of it's a character he puts on, which is fine. And a lot of people like that. I don't, I don't like those, t- that type of person or that type of character, whether it's really him or it's a character, yeah. but to, like you said, to lump him in with something that El Prez said when El Prez can obviously do and say whatever he wants, because for the longest time, and even now he was the head of Barstool. Um, so I, I just, I, I don't know. I think it, it's, it's very short sighted to do that, especially when they're they're getting ready to premiere. And like and like you said, when they're making it a point to say, we're working with these three. We're not necessarily working with all of Barstool. They're not going to have El Prez, and I don't think El Prez would <laughs> accept any offer to even be on ESPN, even if they, yeah, even if they pay. You know what I mean? He does. Yeah. He he doesn't like ESPN. He doesn't want to be in ESPN. But that's not 
But it also goes to show the type of boss he is where he's not going to try and, you know, jump in and be like, no, so I won't be on ESPN, but neither will any of my employees. Like, this is obviously something huge for Big Cat and, and PMT yeah. and Hank. And they've been on before. I mean, they've been on Sports Center with Scott Van Pelt and stuff. So, yeah. He, you know, Prez just, comes out, Prez put out a blog today um, about how he was going to, it was a setup. I mean, he put out a blog right. saying he was going to, re- should he retire for the good of Barstool? And then he did like the rebuttal blog like a second later, basically like stealing that clip from Wolf of Wall Street and saying, I ain't going anywhere. And he just like has, his face plastered over Leonardo DiCaprio's face, which is which is funny. But in the first blog, when he says he should retire for the good of Barstool, he comes out and says he's like, "I'm never, I'm not looking to be on TV. Like, I'm not looking for an ESPN show. I'm here to get Stinky Rich from Barstool and to like help it, you know, help it rise or whatever." He's like, "I burned too many bridges to be on ESPN or to have any kind of like, you know, open dialogue with ESPN. It's like it's great for guys like Big Cat who work their ass off." And like get get to where they are. So he is a team player in that sense. But I I do agree with you. Um, I, I like I like El Prez the character. But as far as like him as a person, kind of a dick. And like I said, he's he's really hard to defend. Like when shit comes it's- out like this. But this is the internet. This is 2017. You better be squeaky clean if you're gonna come out hucking stones at your glass house. Um, and Sam Pounder Sam Pounder had a few old tweets that prez obviously someone probably fed to him um he they were dug up and uh there's a couple bad there's a couple one of them was like is more bad than the other one of them says if you ever want to learn about your family play a game called say anything which i don't know what that is uh nope. apparently my, and then she goes on and says apparently my family is sexist racist and a little redneck and then the second one is watching the lakers in the finals is like watching the slutty girl when best looking in high school she probably deserves it but ill which that one's not as bad i guess but it goes back to the point of like prez strung together a bunch of words and a couple of the words were something to do with her being a slut or like looking slutty um so you know like eh it's like you know pot calling the kettle black here um it's n- tough. you know it's tough like she wasn't directing it at one you know, she wasn't calling someone slutty or sl- she was just in a generic term. But, you know what I mean? It's like. But I just hate tough. it because then, like, you know, you, I feel like I have to take a side, like, just in my own mind, not right, for, right. for any other sure, reason. Sure. And, like, if I were to see her, t- if, you know, I, if I were to see her tweet those two tweets, I wouldn't even think anything of it. Like, it sucks that we have to be in a spot where you have to go back and find these to almost justify your opinion of something. But with her, the way she approached this, you have no choice. Yeah. That's, that's the whole thing. It's like people need to, you need to really pick and choose your battles now online. Like there was nothing there that like, if you had an issue back when this first happened, like that's one thing to like, whatever. I, I don't know if anything came out about it, but like to do it now, like just to clearly just to get at these guys who like, it's the day before their show goes up on ESPN. It's kind of like, and it's not even like really directly them. Like it's not even this, the people you're directing it at. So it's just odd. It's just a whole odd thing. And then for these tweets to come out, it's like you're not exactly clean here. Um, I don't know. But their first guest tonight is Scott Van Pelt, which Big Cat has said in blogs and on um, Pardon My Take that he's been kind of like a role model to him and PFT or like, you know, a mentor as far as, like, getting the TV show and, like, working on their interview style and things like that. So that's really cool. And Scott Van Pelt has taken a liking to um, the PMT boys. So And and so it should be a pretty entertaining show, I think, for the first first episode and for the rest of them, too. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, they Uh, they do a good job. uh, Um, Yeah. Uh, Up next here. uh, So I think, I don't know, was this happening the last time we podcast the whole Harvey Weinstein thing? Uh, and being a real real piece of shit? I don't think so. So Harvey Weinstein, obviously, d- you've seen this in the news. He's a real piece of yeah. shit. Um, sexually harassing, just abusing. Really disturbing um, stuff. I mean, just yeah. beyond. Not not that, you know, there's obviously sexual harassment in general is, is pathetic and disgusting because yeah. especially using it from a, a position of power. Yes. To hold that over someone, you know, whether yeah. it's the same sex, the opposite sex. I mean, it's just compounding how disgusting it is but this guy's this guy's got a real problem yeah so some stories out that are pretty bad yeah i've i've been reading a lot of them and like the whole thing with rose mcgowan i guess that she was raped she she's accusing him of raping her um yep which honestly after reading all these other stories it's like yeah that's absolutely probably what happened 
which is yeah, disgusting I mean, and gross, and that's just like a real, real piece of shit. Uh, but uh, you can't deny that the Weinstein Company has produced some movies that we've enjoyed over the years. Um, and uh, that kind of puts a little bit of guilt on, I'm not going to say on all of us, all the viewers and whatnot, but people like Kevin Smith. Kevin Smith. Yeah. Funded um, his movies, right? What? Some of them. Didn't yeah. they, fund, they, they funded a lot of people's movies. Yeah, but. I mean, Harvey Weinstein was, was um, a mentor for Kevin Smith very early on. And when you listen to a Kevin Smith podcast, like he tells a lot of stories. And one of the stories he always used to tell, like, you know, here and there, but it was like one that was in his rotation, um, was how good a guy Harvey Weinstein is. Not a good a guy, like, I don't think he, like, hung out with him or whatever, but Harvey Weinstein gave him a shot. And, like, if he didn't fund Clerks when he first made Clerks, Kevin Smith's first movie, he would just be a film, he would have just been a filmmaker that was $27,000 in debt from making that movie. Um, he like he brought it to the masses, and then he made Jane, Jane Silent Bob Strike Back, and then the cartoon they made with Jane Silent Bob, and then Clerk, uh, Clerks, and uh, uh, what was the other one? Um, I believe he was also involved with Clerks too. So anyway, Kevin Smith felt terrible about it. I was listening to a podcast he did. He does this uh, um, podcast called Hollywood Babylon with Ralph Garman, who you know the voice of. He does a lot of like Family Guy voices and things like that. But anyway, he uh, he was like very upset. He was like crying. And uh, he just like couldn't believe it, like because he didn't, you know, what I mean, like this, all these stories coming out is not the person, the guy that he knew, right? Um, so he went ahead and he now he's donating all his residuals from every movie that the Weinstein Company has made from here on out to the um, Women in Film charity, uh, which is which is really nice. And so they've estimated that that's about two thousand dollars a month in residuals he gets from those movies. Oh wow! And if the Weinstein Company for some reason goes under, or for some reason the residual starts go- stop coming in, he he's like promised to send two thousand dollars a month for the rest of his life to this charity, regardless of whether or not the residuals are coming in or not. So that's I mean that's awesome. It really is, and it's it must be tough. I mean, in his position, like this is someone who literally funded and yeah in a way gave you your career like for us we're just viewers i mean we just watch it we're uh, yeah you know but i mean for it to be someone who's profiting you know what i mean you're almost profiting off this guy and how he acts and how he does business yeah it's tough Um, that's gotta be tough you couldn't meet a more genuine guy than kevin smith like he you can tell like you know we don't know the innards like clearly like we don't know people but you can really get an idea of what type of person Kevin Smith is, and I can only imagine how how devastated he was when he got this news. Like, what he one of the quotes that he said is something around this. He was saying, um, you know, while he was you know enjoying the time of his life and was like in his prime, making like all this great you know like pretty decent money and like making films for a living, his dream. Like other people were in pain because of you know the same the same person that was helping him achieve all this success. Other people were then like in, tre- in tremendous like pain and uh, and anguish. So it, you know it's it, that's really tough. And like he he said he's like he doesn't want this to turn into like a feel sorry for Kevin Smith because obviously that's not the point of this. Like you know like he happened to be in a situation where you know he wasn't worried about being sexually harassed or abused because you know he's a guy and Harvey Weinstein was into girls. You know that's just like luck of the draw there. So. Yeah. It's really all it is. I mean, so it it's tough, but that's that's I think Kevin Smith donating to women in film is a really nice thing to do. So it's tough to, in situations like this, but you gotta look for the good. So you know, some some good will come out of it, I guess. Um, and hopefully, I, hope so. hopefully, I mean, that's that's hope. the thing. It's you know, you, you try to you try to you know make sure that something good comes out of it. It's tough to look at it now. Yeah. It's just I think it's too fresh. Yeah, I hopefully we'll too, many, to... stories, too many people affected, but yeah, that's a good on him. Yeah, hopefully Harvey Weinstein does not come back to America. He's like off in another country dealing with taking therapy or whatever, right? Or something. Well, I was on SNL. It was like one of the jokes, but they were like, he's in Europe, you know, completing like sex rehabilitation. It's like, huh? I don't, I don't think that's what's happening. Yeah. I'm, 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 yeah. I'm like, really? We're just supposed to believe he's off in Europe? Yeah, I don't think so. Like not sexually harassing people. I don't know. Yeah, but, no. but you know what? You're rich and white. You can, I guess, do whatever you want. Yeah. So. So that's that. Uh, Ryan, what are you watching? What have you been watching? So this weekend, I watched the uh, Spielberg doc on HBO. 
they did a documentary on on Spielberg and it was it was amazing. It was so good. I mean, HBO documentaries are are awesome to begin with. Um, but yeah, this one was like uh, it was almost three hours actually, and really? it was just yeah, it was just so cool. It chronicled like his early life, and then for I'd say like two two hours, a little over two hours, it was just straight him talking film, and which is fascinating to me. Um, they really get. They go deep into like Jaws. Jaws was his first big film, which is insane. Yeah. Um, and like I love, like I've watched the behind the scenes on Jaws like a million times. Just how crazy it is. How how over budget they went. They were months behind on shooting, and like this, it was they screened with studio executives, and everyone told him it was going to be a massive failure. And then he was actually with, uh, it was him, Martin Scorsese, and Brian De Palma. Oh, right, right. Um, and they, like, went, like, they left their apartment or whatever because they all lived together or they were in film school together. And it was opening night, and they just were like, you know what? And Spielberg didn't want to go. He's like, you know, I just, no one, no one's going to like it. Like, this isn't going to be good. And then uh, Scorsese and De Palma were like, no, come on. Well, let's let's go check out the lines. He, and the lines were, like, miles long <laughs> to get into the movie. And um, it was really cool. He's just a very fascinating guy. Yeah. He's so passionate, even now. Mm. I mean, you you can't you. I don't think it's possible to make more money doing something than he has, but you can tell the passion is just there. Yeah. Um. So that was really really good. I would strongly re- strongly recommend that. It's on HBO Go. Nice. I'm I'm definitely uh, gonna watch that. It's on my short list of things to watch. Yeah, it was awesome. And then uh, Kamal, Kamal. I can never pronounce his last name. Not uh, Nanjiani. Nanjiani. Kamel yeah. Nanjiani was fantastic as host of Oh SNL. yeah? He was I'm uh, so glad. I'm so happy. His monologue was just A plus. I mean, I'm always a big fan of stand up comics doing uh SNL because their monologues are just a set. Like Louis C. K., Kevin Hart. Right, right. Those guys always have you know, it's just it, it just works better than like the traditional like song and dance or something like that. And he nailed it. It was just all on like Islamophobia and racism and it was perfect. It was yeah. it was unbelievable. And he actually, if you follow him on Twitter, um, he actually posted a uh, a video and uh, of the monologue. And I guess Steven Spielberg was in the crowd. Oh, really? And, well, you don't see him. Yeah, he was just there, just dropping in. That's funny. And um, he he spinned it and he said, uh, "Here's my monologue. I noticed Steven Spielberg watching me during the beginning and had a little moment. So if you watch it, he just kind of like." notices Spielberg, but you can't tell he notices Spielberg until he mentioned it, but he just <laughs> notices them and he's almost like having an out-of-body experience, like hosting SNL and Steven Spielberg is watching me host SNL, like, and then he just has to continue with the monologue, and it's cool because it's live, like there's no, yeah. you can't freak out, yeah. but just like, imagine that, like, oh, it's so cool. Oh, I gotta go back and watch it. I'm so behind on SNL this year. I watched most of the Ryan Gosling episode, but I didn't see any of the Gal episode or Kamel's. I was all right. Um, like I said, she was just like a little nervous, but he's, I mean, he's someone who's, who's like built for that. If you, if you can do stand up comedy, you can do live TV. You can yeah. do that live sketch comedy. I'm pretty sure he was in an improv troupe. Cause have you seen the big sick? I, so I did see the big sick and I know that, that that's a whole, that's a whole thing, right? It's part yeah. of it. Or he's a stand up comic. He's a stand up comic, but like SNL is very much a part of it. Yes. Uh, just like, you know, there's comics that audition and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think he was in an improv. Yeah. Uh, troupe. He was he was really good. The sketches were really funny. Um, the, the first one, they did one uh, like a game show one. And it was like you like robbed the other contestant. So oh, okay. if, if like so if you, if you got the question right, you took money from the other contestant. So he played like this like slacker guy and Cecily Strong played like an army veteran. <laughs> with like two kids she's in terrible debt so like you don't know it at first so he like gets a question right and he's like ah i'm gonna take all your money and he takes the money <laughs> they're like oh so man what do you do and she's like uh i'm an army vet i did four tours in iraq he's like oh oh no um, can i give this back <laughs> like nope rules are rules you gotta take her money it was, it was really funny that's funny um, yeah so that, that's what i'm watching and uh Two weeks off for SNL, so not so this Saturday, then the following Saturday's off, and then Larry David is hosting again. Oh, I can't wait for Larry David to host. 
Dude, have, fantastic. Have you been watching Curb? I watched the first two. Oh, um, so good. The second one, the second one was just full of ridiculousness. It was so funny. Yeah, the second one was the one with Nassim Pedrad. Uh, no, that was the first one. That was the first one. I think so. Oh yeah, maybe it was. Oh shit, I'm getting yeah. confused. Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Lesbian Barber. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, that was that was a good. One. I think he like they haven't missed. He hasn't missed a beat. Like he hasn't missed a step no. with Curb, and I can't wait for him to host SNL now. That's awesome. It's really great. Nice, nice, nice. Well, uh, I watched Gerald's Game. I finished it. Uh, How was it? Real, real fucked up. Real <laughs> fucked up. Real bad. I mean, not 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 real bad. Like as in the movie was bad, but it was tough to watch. I gotta be honest. For a lot of it. Um, I mean, from like the scene, did you see it? No. So Holly Ugh. thrives on like really disturbing and messed up movies. Yes. And she was having a tough time getting through it because of how disturbing it was. So yeah. that's when I knew it probably wasn't for me. It, you know, it, it, she can't, if she can't get through it, I, I, I don't know if I would. It was, I really enjoyed it. Honestly, it was tough. Like, it, it was very gruesome at some parts. It was really like a mind fuck at some parts. And then like you sprinkle in like the main character had some like back issues with her father and like sexual abuse and like these very graphic scenes. And it is a lot like it was a lot to take in. But the end, it was, it was like a pretty decent payoff and also like a little like M. Night Shyamalan twist that I really enjoyed. Um so I don't know. I I, I I gave it a thumbs up. We on the on the movie club we do thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs medium, so we avoid like the number system because we hate the numbers system. Yeah. Um you know, it's all about like whether you enjoyed it or not, right? So I, I, I said I enjoyed it. Um I just think I think Netflix is doing I've said this a million times, Netflix is crazy with the stuff they're doing. And I'll roll right into the all three things I have on what I'm watching this week is all Netflix original content. So, I mean, not original. Like, this was adapted from Stephen King, Gerald's Game. But, you know, Netflix well, they, did it. They premiered it. Yeah. Um, I also have been watching Mindhunter with uh, Jonathan Groff. I'm going to – so I'll have to talk with Holly about it because I think we both wanted to watch it. So I'm either going to watch some of it this weekend with her or if she doesn't care, I'm going to start watching it tomorrow because I'm working from home. Uh, so my plan was if I start it tomorrow, I'm probably just going to binge most of the whole thing. You're going to you're not going to want to stop watching it. I Lindy and I the other not last night. It was last night. Maybe it was. No, it was Sunday night. Sunday night. Um, I was supposed to watch Gerald's game for to, you last night's movie club podcast. Um, but I ended up watching it last night before the podcast. But Lindy's like, well, let's watch this new show. Jonathan Groff's in it, who he's fantastic in Glee. If anybody's seen Glee, he is Jesse St. James. He is easily the most talented character on that show. Um, anyway, so we started watching it, and we watched one episode. We ended up watching six, uh, and there's ten episodes total. It's weird, though. They're not all the same length. Like, one is, like, 35 minutes. One of them is 52 minutes. Another one's 45 minutes. It's, like, very odd. Um, but they go by very quick, and it's a very good show. Um, I highly recommend it. Netflix is pumping out great shit fucking love it i'm, su- I'm super, excited. super into it it's um yeah i'm not gonna give anyway any of the plot you gotta discover it all on your own it's awesome it's it's just it's you're following two fbi agents and it has to do with serial serial killers and like getting into the mind of serial killers um but it you gotta discover it all for yourself it's it, it's amazing um i've also been watching big mouth which is uh an animated car it's a cartoon on netflix done by Nick Kroll executive produces it, I believe. Um, so it's like all like it's like him and it's uh, Rafi from the league, which I his real name escapes me. Uh, Jason Man, Manzoukas. yeah, yes, yes, Manzukas. Um, and like Jenny Slate and a bunch of like comedians, like in their like group of you know, like all the people they do movies with and whatnot. Um, very fun. Oh, uh, John Mulaney. Is the is a main character along with Nick Kroll, and Nick Kroll does a voice for a bunch of different people. It's very funny. It's about two kids that are going through puberty, um, and there's like a the puberty monster, which is like this monster that nobody can see or hear except for the kid. That you know, what I mean, it's like the, it's like that little voice inside your head to tell you like to do bad things, um, but it's just like a perverted one, and just like telling you like to be a sick perverted little like, you know, 
you know, kid going through puberty. So it's it's really funny and really well done. I really like it. It's uh, the first season is out on Netflix, so been watching that. And I'm planning on watching the Spielberg documentary. Yeah, I would, I would definitely watch that. And there's a there's a just keeping on the Netflix kick. Um, there's a movie with uh, Adam Sandler, Ben Stiller, and Dustin Hoffman. It's called The Meyerowitz Stories. It's supposed to be like a family dramedy. Okay. Um, at it's got like crazy reviews at Sundance and all those festivals. Um, and Netflix like bought it, so it premiered uh, last Friday. Nice. So I, I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna check that out tomorrow. Yeah, I saw it. I haven't. I saw it. I didn't watch a trailer or anything though. I saw that Adam Sandler had a new movie. Does it? D- does this count towards his six movie contract for Netflix? No. Okay. Because this is so. This isn't something that like he wrote or or anything. He, he just, just acted in it. He just acted in it. And Netflix okay. ended up. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Did you see that Rob Schneider has like a show on Netflix now? You know, I've watched that show. Real Rob. Mm-hmm. Is that a Netflix original or is that just a? Yeah. Oh, really? Is it any good? It's it's not. <laughs> what is it about? What what is it like? It's about him. It's just about it's him. So, <laughs> oh my god! It's like him and all like, but all the you know how like Louis would have guest stars of like Joan Crawford and Robin Williams and like Rob Schneider has guest stars of like someone who could be like a trash man or <laughs> there's just like there's no star it's just, it's it's not good yeah uh, it's it tries to be like it tries to be like a louis um or one of those shows and it's just not no i uh, use it to fall asleep too oh okay all right it's one of those shows yeah uh, i mean if you literally 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 have nothing else to watch give it a try but you're gonna be you're gonna be disappointed yeah so sorry rob schneider Sorry, Rob. Sorry, Deuce Bigelow. Hope you are banking on my endorsement. <laughs> um, uh, speaking of TV, uh, let's well go right into TV Club. So the, do- the Deuce, 1.6, Why Me? Uh, directed by Roxanne Dawson, who's um, also directed House of Cards and The Americans, but she's also a very prolific actress as well. Uh, she's been in a ton of things. Um, both on Netflix and HBO. So uh, good to know that. Uh, what was your first? So this this episode is kind of like you start to see all the puzzle pieces falling into place with like why we're seeing cops um, allowing and not allowing prostitutes in some areas, like what's the mob doing and how the mob is connected, and then how does Vincent and Frankie – and that whole clan like fit into that. And also, we've kind of find out that Harvey, the porn director, is also involved um, a little bit in like what's going on with the dealings and the cops and the mob. So uh, yeah. that was interesting. Yeah, it's. I mean, it really. It seems like the mob is, which we kind of had a an inkling of, but the mob, and not even just Rudy, but even the you know Genovese family, which is like his feuding mobster family. He's not part of that family. But the mob is the driving force behind getting these girls off the street and into into parlors yes. or into or into movies. Yeah. So so Harvey would be one of their main connects, one of their main middlemen in the movie industry. And now Vince and um, what's the, what's the, Vince and Bobby are going to really be the main connect for the massage parlors. Yes. But yeah. and I think it goes back to just how well they when you create these characters and you create the universe and you really go out of your way to show the audience like how this world works and Mm -hmm. how these characters fit into this world it makes these like very subtle reveals that much better because everything fell right into place but but it made sense yeah so like the first scene with the first scene when vince is trying to convince the pimps in the barber shop and they're like, fuck you, get you know, get out of here. And they have the right to do that, but then they ended up having no choice. Yeah. They had they had to. Uh, they had to listen. Right. Because the cops are gonna shake them down, they're gonna tow their cars, they're gonna get their girls off the street until you know, it really shows you how little power they really have. Yeah. Which is kind of it's a cool contrast because we've seen them really haven't seen too much of the cops up until this episode. At least, like, enforce the law. Yeah. Like, they've been lenient with the girls. They've been lenient with the pimps. 
I mean, they don't they don't even rest them all. They give them a voucher system. Yeah, they feed them. Um, yeah. but when it comes, you know, when push comes to shove and they want to st- start making money or the mob tells them, Hey, this is how it goes. Now the pimp, you know, the, the pimps really are just working on borrowed time. Yeah. Cause as soon as the cops want to enforce the law, they have no choice, but to put their girls inside. Um, I thought that was really cool, but I, I thought it really benefited from just getting to know these characters so well. And even though it, you know, not a lot was happening in those first four or five episodes, we got to know the characters well, so I think it really helped once the plot started to kick in, which is clearly what's happening. Yeah, so we're starting to see uh, Candy. Uh, I, her real name is Irene? Eileen. Eileen. Um, starting to, now she's doing some porn movies and trying to get that going, and she's really trying to, like, she's pressing Harvey, like, trying to do more movies. And now that the law is getting, you know, the, you see in that scene when they're in the courtroom, like, all um like deviant crimes like that um things that do with porn and and things like that are all getting charges are getting dropped and dismissed so this is an opportunity for Harvey and his you know his porn production company to get going to make more films and um and Candy likes that because she wants to get out of the prostitute racket and she wants to go legit so you know semi legit i guess um so i thought i thought that was interesting love Harvey love him as a character so um, good, isn't he? Yeah, r- real, real good. I, I just recently watched "I Love You, Man," and he's in that. Um, he's one of Jason Segel's like friends that they go hiking with, and he's like very skinny in that movie, and he's a big guy in this one. So he is. He, he that's just his weight, right? That's just like what he is, right? That's not like a fat suit or anything, because his face is very chubby in this as well. Yeah, I was because I'm thinking because when they showed the full body shots, like he's got a. He's, he's big. And yeah. I'm like, huh, I wonder if he's wearing, like, pillows. Like, there's a guy in This Is Us who wears a pillow. Oh, well, really? you can kind of tell. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, like, his belly's huge. Like, he's yeah. got a huge belly. And he's still he's still heavy, but he's not, like, obese. Um, but, and I don't know. That guy's face looks pretty. It looks like it matches the body, right? It looks like he just. It does. Yeah. And you know what? He strikes me as a guy who they're like, so you're going to play the sleazy pawn producer. He's like, all right, I'm going to gain 75 pounds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, That's it's the only thing. Yeah. Cause like if he lo- if he was like a skinny guy like that's that's you know what I mean like he needs to look like he's r- like he's just a, a deviant. Yeah. But I, I liked how he kind he kind of showed his like softer side, especially with Candy like showing up at her her apartment and yeah, trying to help her, her in any way. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. he still has to survive too. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean he can't just be like throwing her money. Yeah. But anyone else would have just been like you know f off like sorry I'll yeah. call you when we got more work but he. You yeah. can tell he kind of like wanted to help her as best he could. Yeah, there's not many of those people in this world that we're seeing here that were living through the deuce, you know? Like, there's not many of those people that are like actually just willing to help. Like, the pimps are very not, uh, they're not very uh, kind to their women. Uh, no. You could say, like, you know, in some part, we, we, we try and like dig and scratch for like ways they're being redeeming to their girls, you know what I mean? But like, in reality, you know, they're just not nice people to, to these girls. But he's actually, you know, he's an empathetic character, I think. Um, so far, at least, you know. Um, so Frankie and Big Mike get uh, hired by Rudy to go uh, tail these guys that are emptying out the porn machine. So these these things that they're emptying coins out of, those are like little things you put a coin in and it plays a porn. Is that, is yeah. that what it is? Okay. Um, so they're like... Try to check if that other family is skimming, right? Skimming on the uh, on the coins. Yep. Uh, and they find out that they are um, by a lot. It seems like fifteen hundred a week or something like that. That they're scamming. Not to mention like all the money they're Too dumping much. into uh, money they're dumping into like the guy who owns the store where one of those you know porn machines are. Um, yeah. But one of the funniest things in this episode was the name that they came up with for their little solution to why guys have to cut holes in their trench coats to jerk off to these porn movies. Yeah. And what what was that? The masturbatorium. <laughs> yeah. Hilarious. White I like I love that scene when like they're they're looking at the drawing and Rudy comes over and he like he sees it like yeah. any normal person and like gets it and Frankie's like it's uh you know it's uh it's like a like, a, like I, I I know what it is. I'm watching it. 
<laughs> like I'm looking at the drawing, and Frankie like keeps trying to explain it to him. He's like, you know, I understand. Like <laughs> this is very self-explanatory. You don't have to keep telling him what it is. But um, I thought that was funny. I thought him and and Big Mike were a, a good uh, duo. Yeah, Big Mike's a smart Mike. guy. He is a smart guy. Yeah, he understood he's, he's, the he understood the little the the tail between the scorpion and the frog. Yep. Yeah. Um, cool. but it's cool because he seems like someone who adapts to whatever environment he's in. So clearly lately he's been around like a lot of prostitutes and bars and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I thought that was cool. I, I, I like that. I really like the episode as a whole. Another, you know, candy is, is becoming a very big character. Um, what did you think with like the, now I'm assuming that was her dad that, that came uh... home and she, yeah, I guess. Yeah, it must have been, right? The one who she, like, kind of, like, she skirted out the back door. Yeah. It must be her dad. So, I mean, I wonder if they'll touch on that. I mean, it's cool because she's, like, a very multidimensional character. Like, I like how she's she's invested in kind of wanting to, you know, do more than just... Obviously, she's trying to elevate from being on the street to... At least if she's in porn movies, it's a little a little better for her, but it's still not like the be all and end all for her. Yeah. You know what I mean? She wants behind the camera. She wants to direct. She wants to edit. She wants to do all that type of stuff. Yeah. And I hope she gets to, you know, I hope she gets to do it. Even yeah. if it is. For, I mean, and like after that scene, when she's at her mother's house and she's, you know, she's promising, she's like, you know, this time next year, I'll have enough money to get a place of our own. So my son can come back and live with me and, and we'll get a babysitter. So you don't have to like keep watching him and all this. So she's very like adamant about wanting to like, stop hooking you know and so yeah and then when she goes and films with harvey and harvey's like you know like he's she's like when's the next shoot and he's like i don't know three four weeks and she's like devastated because she knows that now she's probably gonna have to go back out in the street something that she did not want to do so and then that's when obviously when harvey comes in and like semi saves the day and like is basically sending her to like uh, a whorehouse right like one of the one of the places the parlors that is getting set up Yes. Right. That's what it sounded like. Right. It was like, you know, it seemed like it was more legit than just standing out on the street, which she can't even do anyway now anyway, anymore. Right. So um, helping her out there. I'm trying to think of what other uh, little aspects we had here. We had a little camaraderie between the bartender, uh, Abby, and then what is the the uh, gay bartender's Paul. name? Paul. Between Abby and Paul. That was interesting. I'm not sure where that what if we're going to see. I don't I, I didn't understand that. Did you, what did you get from that? So I kind of took it because they're really two of the people who, for me, don't necessarily fit into the universe. Like they just, they just kind of so happen to be or work at the bar that everyone else frequents. Like this is still a universe about pimps and cops and hookers and and Vince. Um, yeah. But it, I so I kind of think they might have put them together, at, just as a way of to almost make them stand out a little bit more. You know what I mean? Because no, like, what other two characters have those type of conversations? Yeah, like nobody. even when Vince and Abby are in bed, like he's he's he'd rather be listening to the music that's happening than than having an heart to heart with her. Right. Like that's just that's just not that type of character. So I think they kind of put them together just as two characters who like understand each other because they're both not from that world. Yeah, I can agree with that. Uh, so I, I th that's that's kind of how I saw that. Um, yeah. And it's cool because they even they give characters, even if it's a little bit of screen time, even if it's a little bit of a story, you know, they give everybody a shot each episode. You're really not. You're not, you know, losing out on a on any part of, of the story, um, which is cool because they they don't really they don't sacrifice any part of the story by focusing too heavily on on one aspect or another. Yeah, they jump around pretty good. They uh they, do. they they keep it moving a lot. Um Frankie's turned out not to be as big of a fuck up as I as we thought he was going to be, honestly. Yeah. I thought he was going to fuck I, up this job with Rudy. I did too. Yeah. And like they they keep kind of hinting at it in a way, you know, uh, just I I'm just waiting for like the other shoe to drop and for him to make a big mistake that maybe costs Rudy money or something that, cuz that's the only because Rudy obviously loves Vince. Yeah. And they actually had a really cool conversation um, where Rudy was just saying that he doesn't trust anybody and that that's in their nature. But for whatever reason, Vince isn't that type of guy. And that's why he that's why he gave him the bar. That's why yeah. he wants him to run the massage parlor, because he doesn't know many people like Vince or anyone like Vince, really. Yeah. But guys like Rudy, all it takes is one 
one thing to mess up is money. And yeah, no, you're right. That I mean, all changes. So yeah, and I think Vince would try to protect Frankie. Oh, for hopefully sure. not. Necess- hopefully not necessarily take the fall, but you know what I mean. Yeah, that could that could turn things sour. So yeah, definitely. Um, but I really, yeah, like you said, I really enjoyed this episode. Um, hmm. So what are we looking at for next episode? What kind of things are we, uh, I- I'm thinking they're going to touch more on this deal. These like, you know, the, the skimming of money from the other mob family. And I think that Rudy might try and resolve that now that he knows they're stealing, which is probably not great for them. Nope. Not, uh, not, not a guy really not going against you. Yeah, no. Uh, no, no way. I think next episode we're probably going to see the parlor fl- uh, flourishing. Um, maybe some issues here and there. I th- I still think the pimps are going to have a hard time with like understanding the rules. Um, of like how the operation works, how like they're not supposed to be there when the girls are there or when it's open, I guess. Um, so that might be inter- an interesting thing. Um, and then of course that dickhead lieutenant who now he went was he the same one that went to the bar and asked for five hundred a week. Yeah. Yeah, fucked up. That's real fucked up. He just is going, he's trying to get his his palms greased. Um, so now he's doing it at the parlor. Not only is he doing it at the hi-hat, but he's also doing it at the, is there a name for their, for their, the whorehouse? I don't think so yet. Yeah. Well, the hi-hat, right, is the bar. The hi-hat's the bar. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, know. that's, because they're obviously, like, there's a deal. I wonder how Rudy's going to feel about that. About the what? Oh, about the 500? Yeah. See, I don't know. See, the thing is, I guess Rudy is protected downtown. When they say downtown, they're talking about the department, right? Right. So he's protected on, like, the higher level of, of the police, but I don't know if he's going to be wanting, wanting to be kicking back. No, he's before. definitely not going to be. So I wonder if Vince brings that up to him now. And, like, because obviously, like, because his higher-ups are going to tell him, like, fuck off. We already have a deal going. Like, you can't get extra money out of this. You know what I mean? He's just doing it on his own thing. Like, he's going rogue yeah. on this. So, right. I don't know. He just thinks it's invincible. Yeah. Oh, oh definitely. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Um, but, yeah, it seems like they're going to do that. I mean, the, I guess they're going to have to show, like, how the pimps are adjusting to, you know, the girls not be, being on the streets. Because, like I said, the they kind of don't – they don't have as much power if the girls are in the, you know, in the parlors or yeah. they're doing porn. Um, and then hopefully some more Candy, candy and Harvey. Uh, I love – I just love yes. that dynamic. Yes. Uh, just going back to what you're talking about, how like the pimps getting used to the girls working in the parlor versus on the street. I have a feeling there's going to be a power shift to the girls rather than to the pimps, because really, why do the girls need the pimps at this point? They have, they have protection. Right. And I think may like, I think that might be something that like comes up as like you know a bump in the road for like the parlor. Maybe the pimps start pulling the girls out of there because it's like they realize they don't they're not needed anymore. Right. They they don't need they don't need them for protection. Nothing. Nope. So it's you know you think about that and like uh, who knows start becoming obsolete. Yep. Start becoming obsolete. So who knows that that could pop up as well and that's not going to go well for uh, especially for Cece who seems like he was he was not happy at first that his girl was taken to do porn. And he really just like took like took them like robbed them blind, out of yeah. you know just out of threat and anger and uh, intimidation. Just uh, literally taking money from everybody. Yeah, just from everybody, like from the cameraman to the thing. It's like fuck. And like Harvey's just trying to make an honest living, and Candy was just trying to do right by that girl and make her some extra money. It's like what right. the fuck. But he's, I think he's kind of going off the rails now. Yeah, he seems like he's losing it a little bit. Yeah, he's definitely losing it a little bit. I think he's seeing times are changing, and I think he's seeing it before everybody else. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, he's not happy, but, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Is there anything else you want to add about, uh, about the deuce this week? No, I don't think so. Only got two episodes left. Got yeah. next week, Damn. next two weeks. That's it. And then is there anything we're going to be bridging into for the, I mean, we're going to be talking, we're going to be watching walking dead, right? Yeah. Cause walking dead comes back Sunday. Yes. So I won't, well, yeah, I, I will have watched the first episode by the time we podcast next week. So maybe we'll do a double TV club double episode. TV club? And limit some of the other stuff we talk about, and we'll do um, the season premiere of uh, season premiere ep- uh, season eight for Walking Dead, and we'll talk about the Deuce penultimate episode. Yeah, so then that way, once the Deuce ends, we'll just pick up with season what episode three of Walking Dead. Yeah, absolutely, that sounds good to me. And then, right. and then and then we'll have Stranger Things coming, which I'm assuming both of us are going to watch as well. 
So we're going to have a lot that of is, TV stuff to talk about. Better. Damn. Um, and I'm just very... Keeps getting better. Yeah, it just keeps getting better. And I'm very interested this, to hear what you think about Mindhunter. So as soon yeah. as you watch oh. that, text me, and we'll talk about it next week, too. All right, awesome. All right, man. Uh, I think that's going to be it for the Average Nobody's Podcast. Again, you can find us on Stitcher Radio, iTunes, YouTube. Find us all over the internet on all the social media accounts. Just search Average Nobody's and also AverageNobody's.com where you can find everything we do. All the links are there. Um, so check that out as well. Ryan, a pleasure as always. I'll let you know how the name change goes. I'll let you know if Matt. I found my letter. I appreciate it. Hopefully it's someone with some authority to actually change your name. Yeah, not just my gardener. <laughs> I don't have a gardener. So it's an imaginary That's gardener. <laughs> All right, man. All right. Have a good week, everyone. Yep. Talk to you later.